Good morning, members of the jury. We've reached the end of the trial, and now I'm about to present you with my closing statement. This is a timed event, so I'm going to get right to it. This is the last chance that you'll have to hear from me on behalf of Mr. Vance. When I'm done, you'll hear from the Commonwealth. In a criminal trial, the Commonwealth has the burden of proof. Therefore, it gets the last word. When we met last Friday and we had our opening statements, I told you very candidly that sexual assault is a serious and upsetting topic by any measure. But I said to you that just because someone says they were sexually assaulted doesn't mean it's true. And it doesn't mean it's true regardless of the number of accusers or their individual allegations. You know, there's a misunderstanding in our society that when someone's accused of a sexual assault crime, that they're actually guilty until proven otherwise. But you all know different. Having sat on this jury and got this experience, you know what the lawyers and the judge know, which is that in our system, when someone is accused of a crime, regardless of type or severity, that individual is presumed innocent. That individual is entitled to a trial by good jurors just like yourself. And at that trial, the Commonwealth has the burden of proving guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. The judge is going to explain to you later what beyond a reasonable doubt means, but I'll tell you that it's the highest standard of proof known to the law. The Commonwealth defines it as a moral certainty. So the question for you as you go into deliberations later this morning is as follows. Has the Commonwealth proven to a moral certainty that the allegations against Mark Vance are true? As attorneys, we refer to a case like this as a credibility case. And why do I say that? Well, I told you at the opening, and I think you've seen throughout the trial, this wasn't the type of case where you were going to receive any video or audio evidence of sexual abuse. You weren't going to get any credible eyewitnesses of sexual abuse. There would be no medical or expert testimony, no DNA or forensic evidence like you might be used to seeing on television. I told you that the evidence against Mr. Vance would solely be the words of his accusers. That is why we call this a credibility case. And when you're faced with a credibility case, there are only three possible scenarios. One scenario is you believe the accusers. And if that's the decision you make, Mr. Vance is guilty. The second scenario is that you don't believe what they had to say. And if that's the case, he's not guilty. The third is that you're not sure. And in a circumstance like that, the law and your oath as jurors will require you still to find Mr. Vance not guilty. Let's recap the evidence. Throughout the last couple of days, you heard from a total of 10 witnesses, eight called by the Commonwealth, two from the defense, and a series of exhibits, all of which you'll have the ability to bring with you into your deliberations. Let's analyze that evidence. But as we do, I just want to tip you off to something the judge will explain to you a little bit later. When this case first started, Mr. Vance faced 22 charges. Now he only faces 16. The judge will address that with you later. But the reason I'm bringing it to your attention now is because I'm not going to discuss the alcohol to a minor evidence in this case. And there are some of the sexual assault allegations I'm not going to address either. As we analyze the words, of Mr. Vance's accusers, we really have to start out by acknowledging the relationships of the people in this case. This wasn't the type of case where individual, independent strangers, none of whom know each other, came into court and pointed the finger at Mark Vance and said, he sexually abused me. That didn't happen at all. The people that were presented to you by the Commonwealth were all familiar with one another. That's because they're family. The obvious, Kaylee and Brian, biological siblings. Courtney and Chelsea, biological siblings. Danielle and the remainder, all maternal cousins. Their respective mothers were sisters. They had the same grandparents. 
these kids grew up together. These kids spent weekend after weekend together, whether it was hanging out or in a babysitting-like environment. As the years went on, some of these individuals even worked together. And you know from my questioning of them that they're all in contact today. They all stay in touch. They're here today in court. They acknowledged having lunch with one another earlier in the week. These people are a family. And most importantly, we know that in the spring of 2017, Kaylee, Chelsea, Courtney, and Danielle communicated about the allegations against Mr. Vance. We don't know how frequently they communicated about it. We don't know if it was in person or by phone. And we certainly don't know the substance of those communications. But what we do know is that following those communications, the allegations against Mr. Vance were made. And that is a striking fact that cannot be ignored by you when determining the credibility and the truthfulness of the allegations. You heard Courtney say, that after Kaylee had made her allegations in April of 2017, people were referring to Kaylee as a liar, and that motivated Courtney to come forward. You heard Danielle say that after she learned of Kaylee's allegations, she was motivated to come forward. There are a lot of coincidences here amongst these women. We all know from life experience that when accused of I don't say accused, when undergoing trauma of any kind, everyone behaves and reacts differently. Some people handle stress better than others. Some people handle grief better than others, loss better than others, and tragedy better than others. Yet in this case, coincidentally, three women, none of whom, none of whom admitted to knowing that the other was being sexually abused, all came forward at the same time. All of these people made delayed reports. All of these people waited 13 years after the abuse to make it public. All of these people went unnoticed and undetected for 13 years. And in the time that transpired, not a single one of them made a report to anyone whether it be friends or family, the many people available in the school system, teachers, principals, guidance counselors, student resource officers, Kaylee and all of the years that she spent interacting with social workers and investigators with DCF, in and out of group homes and foster care, not a word. The many doctors that she treated with, police officers she crossed paths with, her boyfriend, his mother, her mentor from McDonald's, Elizabeth, who she lived with for a period of time. None of these girls said a word or a whisper of anything to anyone and waited until 13 years transpired to point the finger. And do not underestimate the power of the allegation in this society. When you point the finger at someone and accuse them of a crime, that's all that's needed to get them arrested. That's all that's needed to put them at that defense table and if 12 jurors believe what that person has to say, that's all that's needed to be found guilty. And that is scary. These girls all claim to have been the victims of repeated sexual abuse, but their behavior speaks otherwise. They continue to go to the Vance house weekend after weekend after weekend while they were being abused and they want you to believe it was because of alcohol and cigarettes? Does that make sense? Does it make any sense to you that Danielle Desmaris was a victim of sexual abuse at the hands of Mark Vance, but yet was inviting him to the most important day in her life, besides her birthday, her wedding? Does that make any sense to any of you? Does that stand to reason or comport with your common sense? Kaylee's the main accuser here. I think everyone in this room can agree to that. Kaylee is the main accuser. And I would suggest to you that crediting Kaylee's testimony is a tall order for any reasonable jury.
Kaylee admitted that she is a liar. She essentially told you folks, back in March of 2012, she was interviewed by authorities regarding a claim she made about Mark to a friend. Kaylee told you that when she went for that interview, she was warned of the importance of telling the truth. She was 13 at the time. She was warned that this is a safe zone, a safe environment, and you can be truthful. Kaylee tells the interviewer she made up all of the claims against Mark. Kaylee told the interviewer it was all a lie. And not did she just say that, but she then gave motivations as to why she said she was lying. She said she was trying to ingratiate herself with Samantha, who confided in her in a secret, and she felt obligated to provide one in return. And she said she was mad at Mark. So she didn't only say that she lied about it, but she had the wherewithal to give the interviewer reasons for the lie, such that that interviewer was convinced Kaylee wasn't telling the truth and the investigation against Mr. Vance was closed. That objection sustained the um, remark about the interviewer was convinced um, is stricken, the investigation was closed, please stand. We know that after that interview, the investigation was closed and Mark Vance was permitted by DCF to continue to have access to Kaylee. We know she lived there in 2014, in 2015, in 2016 through 2017. DCF would never have allowed that to happen if they thought Mr. Vance posed a danger to that girl or anyone else for that matter, to include the even younger children, Lindsay and Natasha. And that's just common sense. Kaylee tells you that I lied to DC, I lied to the interviewer because she was getting pressure from her mother, Carolyn. She said, Mom said she hated me. Mom said that the family was shutting me up. Mom turned my sisters against me. Lindsay was mad because she couldn't see her dad. Kaylee said she felt compelled to make up this lie. I don't buy it. And you should neither. Carolyn Collins might not be the award-winning mother, but she told you right here in court, she didn't say those things to her daughter. She certainly warned her daughter about the possibility of making statements like that and how it could result in Mark being arrested, her having to come to court, things of that nature. She said all of that, sure. Those are all known consequences to make an allegation like this. But remember, after March, 12, March 2012, Carolyn continued to allow Kaylee to be with Mark. Carolyn continued to allow Lindsay and Natasha to be with Mark. Don't you think if Carolyn suspected that Mark was doing anything to Kaylee, she would have allowed that to happen? Again, not an award-winning mother, but to put her daughter back into the hands of a sex abuser? It doesn't make any sense. And not just her daughter, meaning Kaylee, but Natasha and Lindsay, and knowing full well that the nieces would visit there weekend after weekend. It just doesn't add up. Kaylee's lie back in March 2012, as she wants you to believe, didn't end there. When Kaylee came to court, she provided you with various instances of sexual abuse she accuses Mr. Vance of committing. We all know that as time passes, memories fade. They don't improve and expand over time. People forget things as time passes. Here in court, Kaylee talks about Mark picking her up in the white infinity, giving her a ride home from work. She's having troubles with the boyfriend, and Mark sexually assaults her in the car. She disclosed that in this courtroom. She didn't tell police about that in April 2017. She told us in this courtroom 
about an instance of digital penetration and Mark got the lotion from the white bottle. <coughs> Details revealed to you, not to police, five years ago. She told about being a young child on Park Street where her grandparents lived, where she lived then with her mom. Mark came by at night after work to tuck her in Lindsay in and kissed her in the mouth with his tongue and touched her vagina. Another incident failed to describe to police five years ago. She talks about eating pickles on the couch and Mark approaching her and sexually assaulting her again. Another instance never mentioned to police five years ago. She talks about being sick in bed after Mark had a back surgery. Mom saying, go into the bed with Mark so he can monitor your fever. She claims to have been sexually assaulted then as well. Another incident never mentioned to police. She talks about the oral sex on Pearl Street and Mark accusing her of biting him. Words of that effect. Facts and details never revealed before this courtroom. She was told about the truth in March of 2012, says she lied. She was told about the truth in April 2017, didn't reveal any of that. She was warned of the truth when she testified here in this courtroom. Warnings, oaths, they're only words, and they're only as good as the person who accepts them. Which version of truth are you willing to buy, ladies and gentlemen? You see, once a liar, always a liar. If you lie, you can't be trusted. Katie Ruff told you she's a liar. I proved to you through my questioning that she's a liar. Therefore, she can't be trusted. If that's not enough, we can you know, keep on going. Let's talk about Kaylee's behavior. Oh, she didn't quite remember. Couldn't remember if she spent Easter Sunday with Mark Vance in April 2017. Thank God for Amy Vance, cleared that up in a hurry. Four days, four days before she accused Mark on April the 20th, she made a nearly 100 mile journey to Georgetown, Mass to celebrate Easter Sunday with Amy and her parents, Paige and Mark Vance. Drove up there on her own, walked into the house, gave everyone a hug, including Mark, and it was just a regular old, uneventful family holiday celebration. Do people do that? when they're being abused? Do they sit down and break bread on a religious holiday with the man that's been violating them for so many years? Does that comport with your common sense? She said that she never called Mark dad and couldn't identify this particular item that she gave him. Amy Vance cleared that up in a hurry. This wasn't the only gift she gave Mark. She couldn't identify that keychain. Any man can be a father. It takes someone special to be a dad. Thank you for loving me as your own. She couldn't remember that. And for some reason, couldn't remember the receipt with her name, address, credit card information on it, showing that she bought it just weeks, just weeks before the allegation. Is that behavior consistent with being a sexual assault victim? You know, people can say anything they want, but the old adage, a photograph tells a thousand words. Looks like a pretty happy Kaylee here. Everyone seems pretty happy in this family photo with Mr. Vance, Amy, the kids. <clears throat> Here's Mark and the girls. Seems pretty happy here. Just like that day at Dave and Buster's. Photographs taken all within the time period. Kaylee wants you to believe she was being abused. So ask yourselves, does that make sense? Does that sit well with you? Remember, anyone can accuse you of doing something wrong, but that doesn't make it true. Amy tells us over the years, it was Kaylee who asked to live with Mark. She did that in 2014, <coughs> she did it in 2015, and she did it again in 2016 to 2017. Why would Kaylee 
want to voluntarily and willfully place herself under the roof and in the hands of her abuser. Don't give me that she had nowhere else to go. Again, Carolyn might not have been the greatest mom, but Kaylee was out of school by then, remember? She dropped out, but she was working full time. Therefore, we can infer she was earning an income. She had her own automobile at some point in time. She had money, she had resources, she could have gone elsewhere. After all, plenty of cousins in the family. We know she had a boyfriend at the time named Carlos, and we know she spent quite a bit of time there as she got to know Carlos's mom. She had options, but amongst them all, she chose Mark. Does that sit well with you? Is that convincing that Mark was abusing her? Lots of the testimony we heard, I would suggest to you, doesn't comport with common sense. You see, whether you look at it from the perspective of Kaylee, Courtney, or Danielle, all of these women are alleging a pattern of ongoing sexual abuse at locations that were always occupied by other people. Now, look, I'm no expert, but it seems to me that if you're going to sexually abuse a child, that's risky business. You get caught, you get in a whole lot of trouble. The child screams or tells somebody, you got big problems. Yet, all of the girls say that these things happened, whether it was Park Street, Pearl Street, Dennis Street, all homes fully occupied by other people, regardless of apartment. If it wasn't Mark's mom or dad, it was his siblings, their kids, his in-laws, and the list goes on. How is it that this pattern of abuse involving three individual girls went on for so long, completely unnoticed and undetected? Does that make any sense? Does it make sense that Kaylee was being abused by Mark in his bed with the brother Jay sitting steps away on the couch in a living room where there's no door closed separating the two? Does that make any sense to you? Does it make any sense that Mark would have been sexually abusing Kaylee while lying in the same bed with Amy and Paige watching television? It was kind of coy and cute of how Kaylee said Amy went out to smoke. Paige was in the bedroom or the bathroom. That was her in-court testimony. But back in April 2017, she told the police they were all under the blankets, lying on their sides watching the movie when Mark put his arm around her and his hand in her pants and her fingers in her vagina. Would something like that go unnoticed? That makes no sense. What about a mother's intuition? I speak to the ladies on the jury. What about a mother's intuition? Kaylee's spending, going home to Carolyn, spending time there. She didn't suspect anything. Leslie, the mother of Courtney and Chelsea. The girls are living at home with mom and dad in Rhode Island. They're going to the Vances every weekend. They didn't suspect anything. Michelle, mother of Danielle and Noella, didn't suspect anything. Here's what else doesn't make sense. Carolyn and Lisa walk in on Mark and Courtney and Mark hides under a visible computer table right in the living room. And then Carolyn directs all of her anger to Courtney. And then Mark walks out unscathed. What kind of woman would let that happen? If that all occurred, you would expect Mark would have got slapped, kicked, punched. And someone would have been told about it. He didn't tell anybody. Isn't that strange? Leslie never heard a thing of it. Mark's dad never heard a thing of it. No one ever heard a thing of it. <clears throat> the Commonwealth 
called a number of witnesses in this trial to do what is called corroborate or to support the testimony of another. So Kaylee, Courtney, and Danielle, those are the accusers. But some of the other witnesses were called to corroborate what they had to say. Let's talk about that. Brian Rupp, he was called as what lawyers would call a corroborating witness. Now, we know Brian is Kaylee's brother and the cousin of Courtney and Danielle. He's 26 years old now. And he tells you that he remembers this one day when he was a middle school student, Courtney slept over and abruptly came into his bedroom. Given his age and the fact that he claims this happened when he was in middle school, that would mean that that incident, if it occurred, happened more than 10 years ago. And Brian claims to remember it till this very day. But how coincidental that after the big police investigation in the spring of 2017, and in the five years that bring us to this courtroom, Brian never said a word of that to anyone. It's not documented in any statement. It was never audited from his lips to the police. No one. Does that make sense? Do you really believe that? That this memory just popped into his mind once this case got scheduled for trial? Chelsea was called. She's now age 32, sister of Courtney and cousin to Kel Kaylee. She was called in to corroborate her sister. You see, Courtney testified to this instance where she claims Mark abused her or tried to. She got away from him, ran across the street to the park, and was barefoot. Now, Chelsea claims that this happened when she was age 17. That would make that incident, if it occurred, happened 15 years ago. Like Brian, she never told anyone about that. She was interviewed by the police in April 2017 and never mentioned a word of it. And here the police are investigating allegations of sexual abuse against Mark by Kaylee, by her sister Courtney, and this fact was never brought up. Does that make any sense to you? Danielle Desmaris, Hyder, was called partially to provide what the prosecutor has already told you, what the judge has already explained to you, is characterized as first complaint testimony. She told you that when she was around age 12, Kaylee was much younger, and at some swing set incident at grandparents, Kaylee said Mark had been touching her in a private area. The problem with that testimony is that it's not supported by Kaylee. Danielle says she told Carolyn about it. Carolyn didn't confirm that. It's not confirmed anywhere or by anyone to include when Danielle was interviewed by the police in April or May 2017. And each time I questioned a witness about a prior statement that they made in the past, much closer in time to when they claim these events occurred than to current day, they all blame the police. Prosecutors questions, oh, the police didn't ask you that, right? Police didn't ask you this question. You only answered the questions you were asked. What a cheap excuse. These people knew why they were at the police station. They knew that the allegations had been made. They were part and privy to those allegations from day one. And yet, these important details, which the Commonwealth is going to ask you to rely upon to convict Mr. Vance, were never documented in any manner. I offer that to you because you can't accept them as credible. The Commonwealth called Carolyn. They called Carolyn because they wanted Carolyn to corroborate what Courtney says transpired in Mark Vance Sr.'s apartment. Courtney describes an incident of sexual abuse in that apartment between her and Mark, and 
she says that Aunt Carolyn and Lisa Vance walked in on them. Did that really happen? I guess it depends on who you choose to believe. One thing I can tell you is that Lisa Vance told you it never did. And Courtney said Lisa was there. And Carolyn said Lisa was there. And Lisa is no longer a part of this family. She hasn't had contact with these people in years. She's the only one who took the witness stand and said things like, this all happened so long ago. I can't remember the exact details of the date or the time or who was doing what. But I would remember if I walked in on Mark Vance with a minor in a sexually compromising situation. And I'm not telling you I can't remember that. I'm telling you it didn't happen. It didn't happen, is what she told you. And I would suggest to you that Lisa Vance has no motive, no interest in the outcome here. Her and Josh have been divorced for years. Yet, she came here into this courtroom and cleared up what I'd suggest to you are some untrue facts. If you've been listening to me this far and following along with the things I've said, now, or at some point later today, you might be saying to yourself, all right, Cal Cagney, these are all great points, but why? Why would Kaylee, or Courtney, or Danielle come into this courtroom and lie? You might be wondering that. You might ask yourselves, what is the motive here? And candidly, I can't answer that question for you. Neither can Ms. Smith or Ms. Thompson, Judge Dupuis, or anybody else in this courtroom except those ladies. You see, when you look at another person, you never know what's going on in their minds. We don't know what motivates them, what fears them, what makes them tick. You can't see inside the human mind. And therefore, unless a motive for an act is obvious, it's impossible to tell. But what I would suggest to you is that we don't know these people. You know them no better than me. Here in the courtroom, listening to their testimony for a couple of hours at a shot, and that's it. But you do know other things about them. You know that this was a troubled family. You know that these girls had problems over the years, whatever they may be, Kaylee in school or at home, drinking, drug use, delinquency at school, DCF involvement, group homes, foster homes. You know that these girls had difficulties. That's what you know. And you know that the stories that they've told in this courtroom have been contradicted by the testimony of other people who have no interest in the outcome. By these items, which cannot speak, cannot be cross-examined, and have no motives, by their own inconsistencies, contradictions, and omissions. And you know that these people are related. And blood is thicker than water. <clears throat> Whether or not Mark Guilty is to be found guilty after this trial is a choice that you individuals will make. You will be choosing whether or not to believe the allegations that have been communicated to you in this courtroom. You'll be deciding whether or not to believe Kaylee, to believe Courtney, and to believe Danielle. And if you choose to believe them, then your verdict is obvious. I would suggest to you that the allegations that have been lodged here are not credible and cannot be believed. Just because someone says they were abused doesn't mean it's true. The power of the allegation is immeasurable. And the only protection that Mr. Vance has is his jury. I've said all I can for Mr. Vance. He's counting on you to say the last two words. Not guilty. Thank you, Mr.
to come second. 